you're there and you're here. And Lord, we fulfill that quota and we elevate you in this room right now, Lord Jesus. Receive our worship as we turn our attention to you. Receive our praise today, Lord God. Amen. Cornerstone Church, good morning. Let's invite Jesus into this room. Oh, Jesus, come on in.
Jesus, you are in this room. Well, church, do you understand? Jesus. When Jesus comes, let me explain to you the book of Corinthians talks about the fact that he dispenses ministry gifts to us to help us along the way. One of those nine gifts of the Spirit is the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is simply this. The Holy Spirit downloading information that is not humanly transmitted. How many know that's supernatural? That's beyond the natural. That's Jesus working through the Holy Spirit. And he has given us a gift of word of knowledge this morning. And I'm going to again share that. everything about us, Jesus. He counts the hairs on your head. He knows the thoughts that you think. He watches your life. He sees when the sparrow falls and you're of much more value than those. So the word that I'm getting this morning is about some people. I think there's more than one very specific word. So you're here this morning, or even online, you can receive this. And I saw you were in the doctor's office. You've been seeing a physician. And you were given a diagnosis by the physician recently. And it's pretty devastating to you bothering you because the doctors told you something about your future about your life but today I want to tell you God says I am here today to deliver a miracle to you and we're not going to receive the diagnosis we pray you're going to be healed I want you to know I, I have so many times been diagnosed with unbelievable you're going to die of pancreatitis you're going to die of this you're going to die of that you're never going to walk again and every single time God steps in so I want us to pray and it doesn't have to be a life-threatening thing some things are devastating to us they're not necessarily cancer it can be something else that is really upsetting to you so i want you right now if you are that person i want you to step to the aisle we're going to be praying i know specifically there are some people here and i want you to step out it can be a smaller thing a larger thing and we're going to pray i've got my prayer team sometimes we have to step out God's here today and he cares about you and Rachel was a name on my heart when I got this but it's not only Rachel Dave could you go over and start to pray for anyone that's in an aisle there's somebody back there I'm going to give you a minute this isn't about me. This is about Jesus in the room. He cares about what's going on in your life. So we're going to pray. Right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I cancel the words of the doctor. I cancel the diagnosis. I say the blood of Jesus is greater than any word from the doctor, any assignment from the enemy. I break off every assignment of darkness. I cancel every disease and every sickness. 
I cancel everything the enemy has tried to steal. I say the enemy cannot steal, kill, and destroy, but God's coming to give you life abundantly. You're breaking through, you're breaking out, and you're going to move forward into a better place since today. You're going to believe the word of the Lord. Lord, I pray for faith to arise. I break off all fear and belief in things that the men, the men have spoken because a man is just a man. But Lord, you died on that cross. You forgave our sins and you healed all our diseases. And you told us to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You told us to raise the dead. You told us to raise, uh, deliver people from demonic assignments. So right now I break every demonic assignment. Some of these are demonic assignments over here. I break demonic spirits off of your family witchcraft in Jesus' name. You have to bow to the name of Jesus. You can no more activate in that family, in that family, in Jesus' name. Release emotional healing right there, yeah, right there in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, you're healing broken hearts. You're healing broken emotions. You're healing broken dreams. You're healing the people today, and we release your mighty, mighty healing balm of Gilead over this house today in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm going see the Holy Spirit's moving all over the room. Let's just wait on the Lord a minute here. Lord, I'm going Amen. Amen. This is a powerful moment. Jesus is doing incredible things right now in this room, in this place. Be the glory. Come on, church. Just receive from Jesus this morning. He's here. Doing amazing things. He's doing amazing things. Transforming lives. Give him praise, church. Elevate him in the room. Be the glory. Be the glory. Great things he has done. Put your hands together. Let's applaud the Lord this morning. You are good. Jesus is not done with us yet. Go ahead and be seated if you would right now. I want you to listen to this story and then I'm gonna share, have David share his story and then I'll tell you another story. These are good, quick stories. Last weekend, do you remember? I asked you to pray for my brother. He was having a cardiac arrest. That started in the afternoon on Friday he was admitted into the Oliver Hospital, Oliver, British Columbia. He was transported from the Oliver Hospital to the Penticton Hospital, where he was undergoing significant treatment, all the while having um, a heart attack. And then he was transported from the Penticton Hospital to the Kelowna Hospital, where he was under the watch of a cardiologist. When you have a heart attack going on for over 24 hours, anybody that's in the medical profession will know and tell you that there is good possibility of heart damage. Add to the equation, when my brother was a child, he suffered from rheumatic fever, which also contributes to heart damage. So there was a lot going on in this story. By the time Monday afternoon rolled around, I'm not going to go into all the procedural things, he was dismissed from the hospital. I'm going to tell you the story. He was, he was, it was projected that he would have surgery, 
and there was all kinds of things that were scheduled with that. No surgery. No heart damage. Everything has come to normality in his life. Jesus showed up and answered the prayers of, your, of God's people. It's a powerful story. To this very moment, we're giving the praise and the glory to Jesus. David, tell us your story. What happened last night? How did Jesus intervene in you? Uh, Bill Johnson was uh, saying there's certain conditions here and you have this condition I want you to stand up and one of them was hearing loss and I worked 50 years in manufacturing and and I thought well what I can hear he says yeah but not perfectly you have a certain lower levels that I couldn't hear very well I said Lord I can hear he says no I want to reveal my power and the thoroughness of how I heal. I do things intentionally, and I'm very thorough. I said, okay, so I, so I stood up. And so anyway, um, he had people around lay hands, just one person, lay hands on the person that, that raised their hand. And so the brother asked me, what's up? I said, well, I have hearing loss in the lower decibels. It's okay. And so anyway, he, he began to pray, and I felt the power of God. <laughs> I'm feeling the power of God right now. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I know when the power of God is there, the anointing is there, and Jesus is there. And so I said, okay, Lord. <laughs> Heal, I believe. I do believe. And um, when he finished praying, he, he stood back. He talked real quiet. I said, I could hear you. He backed up. I repeated what he said. So Jesus healed me last night. And what and, and, and the thing I thought about that on the way home. And you know, I'm not gonna teach. I love to teach, so I'm gonna keep this short. But anyway, um, I like to talk. Uh, about Jesus. He said, David, it's not a matter of can my people believe, but will my people believe? Will my people believe? Peter healed. God used Peter to heal a man. And the church of that day couldn't figure it out. You know, they tried to reason it and try to figure it out. And the guy said, you know, all I know is that <laughs> I, I couldn't walk, but now I can. That's all I know in the name of Jesus. And Peter stood and said, you know, it's not because of our goodness. It's not because of what we have done but by faith in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Everything in heaven, on earth, and below earth must bow to the name of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This brother, when we got done, I said, what's your name, Kevin? Where do you go to church? I'm a charismatic Catholic. <laughs> I said, whoa. God is kicking down all denominational lines with this move. Will we choose to put faith in the name of Jesus? So I didn't need to be healed because I could hear but Jesus said, no, I want to show you how thorough I heal. How thorough I heal. Awesome. Well, let me say this. A few months ago, not only can he use charismatic Catholics, but a few months ago, he can use, how many know he can use the, the Internet? Now, that's, a, that's going to stretch you. Uh, a while ago, a few months ago, there was a gal 
listening online to one of our programs or mess, oh, what do you call this thing? Streamings, our services. That's what it is. It's a service. And, um, and she had holes in her heart, had a hole in her heart. And you're going to hear her testimony. She's probably going to be here within a month or so. And you're going to hear about how God healed her and restored and fixed her heart. It's about Jesus. You were given a packet when you came into this room this morning. And that packet has a wafer. It has a, uh, some juice. And it represents the body and the blood of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a whole lot more going on than we really realize. The Bible gives us insights here, there, and everywhere as to what's going on on the cross. By his stripes, we were healed. How many know that was part of the crucifixion? Redemption took place. Jesus tore. The, te the, the veil was rent in the temple from the top to the bottom. We have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. The father accepted his complete sacrifice. Jesus is the sum total of our new journey. We've been born again. It's all because of Jesus. And these little emblems represent that. And I don't want you to look at these emblems and diminish the work of Jesus because the work of Jesus was big time. It was the one and only catastrophic event that happened on the planet. And we're here today to give thanks. I want you to take this bread right now, the wafer, because it represents the body of Jesus that was sacrificed so we could experience this new life and all that it entails. And I want you to take this away from me. I want you to eat it in thanksgiving this morning for all of what Jesus did. By the way, let's be clear. He died so we could have life. He ended his human life so you can have eternal life. Of course, you know the end of the story. He didn't stay in the grave. He rose completely victorious. So let's eat this bread right now and let's give thanks to Jesus for his willing sacrifice. packets also some juice if you locate it we'll drink together but this juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of our sins The Bible says, it makes it clear that life is in the blood. When Jesus died and shed blood for the remission of our sins, how many do understand when you came to faith in Christ, you were given a, can I put it this way, a blood transfusion? Royal blood now flows through your veins. You are, your DNA is connected. A lot of things happened. Your DNA goes to the Father. Jesus is your brother. Come on, church. He's the son of the living God. We become sons and daughters of the 
Father. We've been accepted into the family, the household of faith, because Jesus completed his sacrifice. He gave his body and he shed his blood. Let's drink together. I've asked Jason to come. Jason is one of the pastors at Mana House Church in Portland. I've asked him to come, and on behalf of this congregation, I've asked him to talk to Jesus on our behalf. So as he talks to Jesus this morning, I want you to own the conversation. Let Jesus be elevated in your, your life. Come on, just close your eyes this morning. David and Pastor Larry made a statement at the very beginning of service if you arrived late about how do you get Jesus into the room and how do you keep him there? Questions maybe, statement maybe. And the answer's easy to say maybe, but hard to do. Jesus would tell us through Revelations 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And whoever would open the door and invite me in, I'll come and I'll dine with you. So the answer to the question is, do we invite him in? This morning as I pray, I want you to invite him in to your sin. Because he wants to forgive you. I want you to invite him into your sickness because he wants to heal you. I want you to invite him into your brokenness because he wants to mend you. Whatever it is in your life, we take communion together as a church family, but it's personal. He's knocking on your door. And will you choose to open the door and invite him in and allow him to dine with you this morning? Come on, Father, we just thank you for your broken body for us. We thank you that so long ago, even before you dying on the cross, you came to a table, an intimate, personal table, and you had a meal with your followers, and you said, do this in remembrance of me. And then so many years later, through the book of Revelations, you say, you know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. I will always be knocking. I will always be at your door. I will always be present. Will you invite me in and have that same fellowship and meal? So, Lord, this morning, as we come to the table, we invite you in. Lord, all across the room, we're invite you, inviting you into those areas where we've fallen short and sin. We're inviting you into those areas of our body, Lord God, that are sick. Lord God, and have a diagnosis, Lord God, that need a fresh touch, that need a healing. We invite you into those areas, Lord God, that are broken and out of alignment with you, out of alignment with your word. Maybe we have a relationship, Lord, that's not walking in unity. Lord, we come and we just bring these things to you because we're opening the door. We're allowing you into every area of our life and we're thanking you for your broken body and your shed blood and for all that you've done on the cross. Because of the work of the cross, Lord God, we can have healing and wholeness and be set free. And Lord, we thank you for the power of your blood, the life of our Savior is in the blood. And when we drink that cup, Lord God, when we remember, when we invite you in, you come and you live inside of us. 
Come on, church. Every one of us this morning has a resurrection power within us. Come on. We have resurrection power flowing through our veins. Come on, Father Jesus, we thank you for resurrection life. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. And we thank you for, Lord, the ab promise of abundant life here on earth. And Lord, today, as we, Lord, just wrap up this part of the service and wrap up coming to the table, Lord, we thank you and we give you all the praise and all the glory and everybody said amen amen, amen. amen. I'm going to talk to you about growing faith in a moment but I do want to remind you that of a couple things this church is in existence in Grace Harbor to extend the kingdom of God. When I say church, I don't mean the building, I mean we. We here, lift your hands if you're living and you're breathing and you're a citizen in the kingdom. Come on, lift your hands up. Okay, so we're the church and we the church are designed by God to extend his kingdom. We're poising ourselves for the next natural season, which is the fall. On September the 17th, we're gonna, as a local church, we're gonna make available opportunities for you to sign up and be a part of growth classes, training opportunities. We'll get to that in a little bit. I'm excited for what's happening just down the hallway earlier Sunday morning. The Hispanic Ministries just need you to know that Simone, come on, Simone, stand up. Simone has agreed to give leadership and oversight to that group of people. We're excited about all this. This is special, how God is giving this house favor in this community to reach people. This is just the tip of the iceberg. You're going to see what I have to say. Then you can give this morning by placing your tithes and offerings in the reception box in the foyer. You mail in or you can text in or you can go on the website. Those uh, four pathways are expressed on that uh, screen this morning. Take your Bibles if you would. And if you would give opportunity to turn to First John. I have to interrupt this program for a special announcement. Um, 55 is a good number. That was a good year for Chevrolets. How many would like to have a classic 1955 Chevrolet? Yes. So today, I have the honor of us recognizing an amazing couple married for 55 years. Is, is that today? Today or when? When? when the 31st, 55 years. 31st of August, okay. But that is a testimony in itself. It's a witness of commitment to one another, a commitment to God, um, a representation of the church's relationship to Jesus. Every day has been just wonderful, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's been yeah. a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. So, so I'm just saying that, you know, Relationships grow us. Relationships develop us. Relationships mature us. And I had a couple of scriptures I want to speak to you too. I know we know these scriptures. But he who finds a good wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from God. There's favor on you, has been for many decades. And who can find a virtuous woman? Her worth is above rubies, above all rubies. And what is virtuous? 
having and showing high moral excellence. I was reading Proverbs 31 this morning, and I'm thinking, man, Sharon, you exemplified what's written in Proverbs 31. Your children have risen up and called you blessed. Your grand grandchildren have risen up and called you blessed. And so, personally, and I know as a corporate family, we are honored that you are our pastors and that your lives exemplify Jesus. So thank you. So this is just a small token from the family of our appreciation and thanks for both of you. Yes, sir. So do you have any keys as to what makes a marriage last long? To share with them. Keys. Well, <laughs> you tell them. <laughs> Keep short accounts. Ah, there it is. Keep short accounts if you didn't hear that. That's, that's Thank you very much, everyone. It's just our privilege to serve the Lord. And, you know, this is where God has planted us and called us. And sometimes, you know, there were other opportunities that would come. It's like we can't just go chasing after something. We have to go where God wants us, and God wants us here. And so we are just thrilled, and it's a privilege to serve the Lord wherever he puts you. Awesome. Thank you, Sharon. Awesome. Thank you, church. Just crossed my mind, we have three of our four children here today. Craig, of course, the oldest. Dana is our second. And Renee lives in Monroe, Washington. And Rachel is our youngest, all right? So what a... There's a family time this weekend, so it's awesome. Take your Bibles, First John chapter 5. I, I'm sensitive to the time, but can we just walk into this? All right, I'm aware, I'm aware, but God would like to download something into our hearts, I believe, this morning. John First John 5, 4, the English Standard Version puts it this way. Everyone who has been born of God. Let's stop. This verse doesn't apply to every living human being. It's speaking of the fact of everyone who has been born again by the Spirit of God. Throughout the ages, in past times and in current times. Anybody born again in this room? So this is your verse. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That's a system out there that's pitted against the ways of God. Are you clear on that? And this is the victory that has overcome the world, it's two words, our faith. Our faith in what Jesus has done in our life sets you on a new path and gives you a new life. I want to begin this morning by relating a true story or a recent account from the golf world. If you don't mind, I apologize in advance, but can I help it? You may not be a golfer or even a golf fan, but you can benefit from this story, I tell you. There was a young, and he is a young man, his name is Wyndham Clark. Just curious, does anybody remember that name? Not a soul in this place. <laughs> can hardly believe this. Well, Wyndham Clark happens to be a golfer on the PGA Tour. Let's start there. However, there are more things about Wyndham Clark than golf. First of all, let me tell you that he is a believer. He's a Christian, and he loves the Lord. But 10 years ago, 
while in college, there was a traumatic event that occurred in his life. His mom succumbed to cancer and died. Her last words to her son was to keep on pursuing golf and to persevere. She told him to use the platform that God would give him for the glory of God. Well, last May, just a few months ago, I don't know where you were, but it was all over the news. Wyndham Clark won his first PGA Tour event. As a rookie, it was a long time coming and a lot of work in between. Six weeks later, again, I don't know where you were. He rose to the challenge again, and in June, he won the United States Open Championship. He is your champion, golf champion. And you don't even know it. What's more, his name has been added to represent you in the United States in the Ryder Cup, which is coming up in a couple, few weeks. You got to get familiar with this church. This is important stuff. Wyndham had persevered through many losses. He went through depression, anger, and frustration. You see, three years ago, Wyndham Clark was a wrecking ball. His life as a Christian was down the tube. His caddy, John Ellis, a former golf uh, college coach and caddy, gave him the ultimatum. He said, Wyndham, change your attitude or, ch or quit golf. And in that moment, he shifted his attitude, he got help, and surrounded himself with people who could get, give him a reason to believe again. And there's a reason that I'm telling you this story this morning. Because Wyndham Clark flipped the switch in his life. It wasn't that he was not a Christian or a believer. It was a matter of tuning or turning a corner and applying faith to his life as a Christian. And you might be at that point in your life. I've got good news for you today. If you are eager to fully invest your faith, and you see the futility of investing or putting stock in other stuff, there's no end to where God can take you. I want to make a statement this morning that I hope you remember. We were, we were given a very huge principle, and we, we actually acted on it today by stating it many, many times. A key thing for us as a people is to invite Jesus in the room and to keep him in the room. I'm going to give you another statement that I want you to hang on to. There's no end to where God can take you. You see, faith does not peak in our lives. You can't peek out when it comes to faith. What's the tallest mountain on the planet? What's the tallest tree on the planet? It has a peak. But with faith, there is no ceiling. I want you to get that, church. With faith, there is no ceiling. There is no limit. Even the sky is not the limit when it comes to faith. Your faith can just keep going, 
getting stronger and growing deeper. However, this will only happen as you are planting your faith in the correct types of soil. I want to give you places this morning where faith grows. Where does faith grow? And if you invest in these places this morning, church, there's no telling what God has for you. Because your faith will be limitless and never, never peek out. Here are three places where faith grows. Number one, the Bible, God's Word. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. It's great that I give you a message every Sunday morning. But these messages are not meant to be the sum total of your spiritual diet. It is meant to prime your pump so that throughout the week, every day, you have an encounter with God's Word. Are you encountering God's Word on a daily basis? So, if you're struggling in your faith today, Get alone with your Bible. Open it. Read it. Jot down some notes from it. And thereby, covenant with God in prayer that you are going to live out its truth today and every day. The Word is, the one, the, is one of the key places where faith is going to come from in your life. It's where it's going to grow. Number two, fellowship. Faith also grows from time spent with other believers that are pursuing God. Pick your friends and pick them wisely. Some people that are sowing into your life are deadbeats. They're doing absolutely nothing to encourage your faith toward God. Now, I'm here to tell you that we have relationships in our life. It's like concentric circles. I have a lot of friends. Some of my friends aren't even Christians, but I don't sow I don't, I, I, they don't sow into my life essential values. I'm a friendly guy, and I have friends, widespread friends. But I tell you, it's the close-knit friends that I have that I choose very carefully that are going to be sowing kingdom values into my life. There are times where your faith can be challenged and stirred up as you interact with other Christ-like followers. I want, I want you to see something in the scriptures here, particularly out of Romans chapter 1. When Paul talked about going to Rome to meet with the brothers, he didn't, it wasn't, topmost on his list that they talk about the weather. They weren't talking about their golf game. He didn't go to Rome for frivolous reasons. 
Look what he says. His expectation in verse number 12 was this, that we may mutually, that's together, encourage each other's faith. Paul was interested in bolstering and encouraging the faith of those around him, and that, by the way, encouraged and bolstered his faith. They talked about Jesus. They talked about what he meant to their life, about the mission, about sowing into other people. It wasn't about the next potluck that was coming up. Paul was interested in the fact that his fellowship with other believers was one of quality and had content to it. If you want your faith to grow, be grounded in God's word and pick your friends carefully. Because those are the people that you're going to be sowing your life into and they're going to be sowing into you. What are your close friends sowing into you? Because this can be not only an an event of Paul's life, but it can be an expectation for our lives as well. Fellowship. Thirdly, God's house. We're talking about soil here, church, that we can grow faith in. Let me just say this. There was a I, and, I, and I say this to commend the city of Hoquiam and the city of Aberdeen for beautifying the corridor where when people go through our community. They see these beautiful petunia flowers. How many enjoy looking at the flowers in our communities? That, that's beautiful. So we're right on the corridor here, and I kind of got a brainy idea. I says, you know, we got two flower pots there. We better, we better do our part. So we bought up a bunch of petunias, and uh, and they're growing. Well, yesterday's heat kind of got a little bit to them, but we poured water on them this morning, resuscitated them, and 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 when we planted these petunias, we took out all the bad soil, and we put in very very good soil, and we're seeing a harvest which is good. I say that to say this, soil is important. And the soil that we grow faith in initially is God's word, fellowship, and I wanna say God's house. We are entering a new and different season of the year. And this might be a good time to make a shift in your attitude towards the church. your spiritual family. You see, too many Christians treat the church as if they only need it every so often. It has really nothing to do with the faith factor in their life. I want to change your thinking this morning. As good as the online services are, it's so much better. Online services are designed if you're just flat out unable for one reason or another to be in the house. But how many know more goes on in the house than what you're capturing online? So a casual attitude to the house of worship will affect your faith walk. Negatively, by the way, not positively. But your faith when leaving a church service can be more vibrant and alive than when you are actually entering or going into the service. And God has designed his house to be a place 
where we gather and we encounter him. And therefore, we leave renewed and we leave refreshed. Hebrews chapter 10, 25 puts it this way, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. In other words, some took it upon themselves not to take this too seriously. But the writer says, encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing nearing. Get to the house of God. So if you're frustrated today that your faith isn't stronger, which may be the case, maybe, your faith, you're looking at it, isn't as strong as the next person's seems to be. Yet you're too seldom in places where faith is being built. It seems you are like someone complaining about the darkness while sitting in the basement under the blanket with the lights turned out. Here's my, here's my counsel to you this morning. It is time to flip the switch. Time for a Wyndham Clark moment in your life. Flip the switch and see what God can do when you turn that corner. Don't look at faith as if it's something that only belongs to other people. Or that it requires a mysterious secret that you can't quite yet figure out. You can have faith that stands strong amid trials. A faith that enables you to trust God when it's hard. And you're going to have moments like that. And a faith that helps you overcome sin. But you won't have such a faith if you're, not, if you're forsaking the places where faith is built. So let me wrap it up and say this. Faith is built in three areas. Not one of three, but all three. In the Word of God with the people of God, and in the house of God. Here's, here's what your part can be this morning. First of all, you can believe that your faith can increase. You've got to have that mentality. My faith can increase. Secondly, expose your mind to God's word and his ways. And finally, practice genuine prayer. But grow your faith in his word, in fellowship, and in the house of God. Wow, we get to do this. This is the first Sunday of the fall season. We get to start our life in this season just like that. And who knows, by January 1st, what this is going to look like. Stand to your feet with me, would you? Awesome. Put your hands up to God. And simply tell him in your, your own way this morning, that you're flipping the switch. You thank him that you're a believer, you're a Christian, but you're flipping the switch. You're changing your attitude. And you're gonna be proactive when it comes to God's word, proactive when it comes to the people of God in your life, and however that fleshes out, and proactive with his house. Lord Jesus, today we are 
We're your people. We are citizens of your kingdom. And we've been distracted and subsequently our faith has been affected. But today we're turning a corner and we're trusting you to change our faith walk today. We're gonna do our part. We're gonna believe you that our faith can increase. That you'll transform our minds and we'll engage you with meaningful conversation. Accept us, Lord and do a work of grace in your people today. We pray this in the mighty, mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Can anybody say amen? Oh, let's give Jesus honor today. Let's give him praise today. Wow, what a day we've had. Come on, church. So much has happened in this place. However, if you still have a need in your life and want special prayer, we do have a prayer team that will pray with you. Otherwise, God bless you. Have a great day and have a powerful week in the Lord.